Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> um, my plan today is uh, one more time in Kripke just to talk around various aspects of rigidity and necessity to the point where I hope we will all feel completely comfortable um, with these ideas. And uh, on Friday, we will go on to Putnam's uh, article, Meaning and Reference, which actually really is continuous with the Kripke. And after Putnam, we'll be going on to Evans. And um, Putnam and Evans are really building on Kripke, so all these ideas we'll keep coming back to from different angles. Um, so I want to start out by looking at uh, what Kripke said about um, illusions of contingency, why it's kind of a surprise to find that Hesperus is phosphorus is a necessary truth. Um, and then I want to come back to what we were talking about last time with um, the strangler and uh, different kind of names and so on. Because um, uh, after last time's discussion, a number of people made some very helpful comments about how I could have explained it better. So I'm going to take another crack at it and uh, then go on to review the definition of rigid designation and something about um, extending Kripke's approach beyond just ordinary proper names. Okay, so let's start out looking at what Kripke says about Hesperus is phosphorus. Okay, class, Hesperus is phosphorus. Do we think that that is A, necessary, or B, contingent? Is this rigid or flexible? Is this rigid or flexible? Is the whole thing necessary or contingent? What a good class. <laughs> okay, are, are you reasonably comfortable with that so far? Yeah. Uh, because actually what we're going to do is just keep, uh, I'm going to do today is just keep coming back at this from various angles. But that's like the basic datum we, we want to try and keep prodding away at. Um, okay, the one objection Kripke considers, you might have to say, look, that's necessary, is to say, well, after all, couldn't it have turned out that Hesperus was not phosphorus? I mean, presumably there was a point in human history when nobody knew whether Hesperus was phosphorus. Um, I mean, lots of these informative identities are like that, right? You, it, it was a surprise to find out they were true. Um, but if it could have turned out that Hesperus was uh, not phosphorus, well, doesn't that mean that it's contingent if Hesperus is phosphorus? Uh, I mean, this is one thing is, though, that this isn't just supposed to be an epistemic possibility. It's perfectly all right for Kripke to say there was a time at which, for all we knew, Hesperus could have turned out not to be phosphorus. But could it really have turned out that Hesperus and phosphorus were different things? If that's possible, that Hesperus and phosphorus were different things, then it can't be necessary that Hesperus is phosphorus. So here we have... Um, uh, Hesperus coming up over the morning in the Pacific, and here we have dear old phosphorus in the evening. Um, okay, there they are, as you can see, they look rather different. Uh, couldn't it have turned out that they were different things? Isn't it possible for those to be different things? Um, if that's right, then that's a challenge to the idea that the identity is necessary. Well, what Gribke says about this is that it really could have happened that you had a visual presentation like this of the heavenly body in the evening and a visual presentation like that. Uh, sorry, a visual presentation like this of the heavenly body in the morning and a visual presentation like this of the heavenly body in the evening. And it could have been that these two visual presentations were presenting different objects. That really is a possibility. There's a possible world in which that happens. You get a presentation like this in the evening. You get a presentation like that in. The, uh, you get a presentation like this in the morning. You get a presentation like this in the evening, um, and they're actually presentations. They're in fact presentations of different things, right? That's got to be possible. Yes, but the question is, are you describing then a situation in which Hesperus is not phosphorus? If you are describing a situation in which Hesperus is not phosphorus, 
then it's possible for Hesperus not to be phosphorus. So it can't be necessary that Hesperus is phosphorus. Follow me very closely here. But the argument is, this isn't really a situation, although it's possible that there could have been different uh, heavenly bodies um, providing this presentation and that presentation, at least one, one, either this one wasn't Hesperus or that one wasn't Phosphorus. It was something different that was presenting in that way. It was something different that looked like that. So what you've got is a situation in which there are two distinct bodies um, occupying the very positions occupied by Hesperus, Phosphorus, Venus. Uh, but these are different. One of them is not Hesperus or one of them is not Phosphorus. So Kripke's general answer to this kind of objection is any necessary truth, whether it's an a posteriori necessary truth um, or an a priori necessary truth, could not have turned out otherwise. It could not have turned out that Hesperus was not phosphorus. That's not really possible. But in the case of some necessary a posteriori truths, like Hesperus is phosphorus, you can say that under appropriate qualitatively identical evidential situations, so the qualitatively identical means you're getting presentations like this and this, it seems just the same. Under appropriate qualitatively identical evidential, situation, evidential situations, an appropriate corresponding qualitative statement might have been false. So in this situation, you might have used words like Hesperus and Hesperus and uh, Phosphorus here, actually. Um, but you wouldn't have been talking about the same objects. Uh, so that statement in that situation would have been false. Under appropriate qualitatively identical evidential situations, an appropriate corresponding qualitative statement might have been false. So there is a kind of illusion of contingency there. Because you could have got a situation that was for all the world, just like, seemed just like the situation we actually have. And in that situation, what you'd have expressed by Hesperus is Phosphorus would have been false. But really, you wouldn't have been talking about Hesperus and Phosphorus there. You'd been talking about some different object. Because if that one really was Hesperus and that one really was Phosphorus, they'd have been the same thing. Here ends the first lesson. So it can look like Hesperus is Phosphorus is contingent, but that's just a mistake. Once you know all the facts, you realize that the identity is both true and necessary. Yes? The dubbing, yes, yes, you say, I dub the Hesper Hesperus and I dub the Phosphorus, yep. Well, I, I, isn't the photograph good enough? I mean, uh, I'm trying to show the qualitative evidential situation by using the photograph. You could have a situation that seemed just like this. You have the same pixels even though it's a different object at the other end. Yes, fixing of the objects is done by doubling, sure. The dubbing is what, that's right. That's right. We are, we, we, not supposedly, we are fixing the reference by that dubbing.
That couldn't happen. That's right. But that, that's not the supposition. The, 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 point, the, the point is rather, you could have a situation, you can have a qualitative situation, a situation that's qualitative like this, and you say, I dub the um, uh, phosphorus. You could have a situ another situation that was qualitatively just like this one, but it was actually a different object you were looking at. Um, and you say, I dub the phosphorus, and it's actually a different thing you've dubbed. Um, I mean, it could happen with um, dubbing a person. Right? You say, um, I dub thee um, Balthazar. Um, but, uh, and then a qualitatively identical situation, you've got the identical twin, and you're saying, I dub thee Balthazar. These are two different dubbings. They're, they're dubbings of different objects, but they're qualitatively very similar. Yeah? So um, the, the point is that in the actual, g given that what really happened, we actually did dub the same object twice over. And once that's in place, the identity is necessary. But you can make sense of the hypothesis of a qualitatively similar situation in which you had dubbed different objects twice over. Yeah. That, that's the thing that makes sense. That's where you get the illusion of contingency. That's why you might mistakenly think that Hesperus was phosphorus was not necessary. Last call. If you can formulate it as a question, then raise it. Yep. Uh huh. Yes. The way you'd establish a truth here is by something of a spatial temporal location. Which, yeah. It is important to distinguish all these different factors, you're right. Um, but the, 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 the simple idea here is you're taking one object, Hesperus, and you're saying of it, Phosphorus, that is one and the same. So if it's one and the same object in this world, how could it, here is something like this is what really is intuitively driving Kripke's thing. If it's one and the same object in this world, how could it somehow split apart in another possible world? I mean, if it's split apart in another possible world where you have two objects, and in fact you only have one in this world, how does that even make sense? If there are two in some other possible world, how, they can't both be identical to the original one. Do you see what I mean? Because they're two different things. Yep. So it really, there really is kind of commonsensical if, if Hesperus really is phosphorus, then um, it must be necessary. But you, could, how, you, you can't make sense of it splitting up in different worlds. How could you split with yourself in a different part? I mean, it's <laughs> it, it, somehow with yourself, actually, it's so tempting always to imagine, well, maybe I could be in two different places um, or many different places. Wouldn't that be grand? Um, but really, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, because which one's you? Yeah. Um, so there's that, but at the same time, you have to try and do justice to the sense that, well, after all, there are, uh, uh, there are things that could have turned out otherwise here. And that's what this is trying to do. It's saying that you can envisage a situation which is for all the world like the actual situation, but actually you were talking about two different objects when you said Hesperus and Phosphorus. So you're actually envisaging here a situation in which it wouldn't even be true that this one is that one. Yeah. There were always two objects, if you see what I mean. Yeah. 
That's right. The, the illusion of contingency, but ultimately, it's really a thing about epistemic possibility and not a proper possibility, metaphysical possibility. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yep, yep. No, I'm just looking for people who hadn't asked a question, but carry. No, it doesn't explain why the designation is rigid. Okay, that's, uh, uh, that's our next topic. Okay, okay. Okay, are we reasonably comfortable with that? Okay, um, so l l let's go back to this thing about descriptions and names. Um, so, okay class, um, the inventor of the wheel, is that, um, so that designates an object all right, but we can make sense of talking about that as a de designating an object, the one and only one person who invented the wheel. All right? Does that designate the same object in every possible world? No. So that is a flexible designator. Consider the actual inventor of the wheel. Is that, 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 that designates someone all right? Does that designate the same person in every possible world? Yes. Because every time it designates someone, you have to keep tracking back. You, you, for every possible world, um, when you want to know who the actual inventor of the wheel designates in any possible world, you have to look back at the actual world and find out who in the actual world invented the wheel and then look at what that person's up to in this world. Yes? So the inventor of the wheel is flexible. The actual inventor of the wheel is rigid. Yes? Nixon, yeah. Uh huh. Yes. What exactly are we dubbing if we're not dubbing with uh, like mental states or, or physical features or any, any type of descriptive? It could be different person. Right. It hasn't existed at all. What are we going to do? What makes it rigid? What are we dubbing that's going to make him the same person in every single possible world? Yeah. The, the idea is the picture is, you might not think this is satisfactory, but the picture is. We're designating a particular object, and then it gets up to lots of different stuff in different possible worlds. And if you say, what makes it the same object? The answer, Kripke's answer is, there is no plainer English than that. It's the same thing. What more do you want to know? I, I, don't, I guess um, I just want to know what exactly we're naming if it's not going to keep it. It's if it keeps shifting like that. Yeah. I agree. The, 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 that is... Um, when Kripke talks about the telescope view of possible worlds, yeah, he's talking about a picture in which you've got one possible world here, you've got another possible world there, um, you look at all the uh, what's going on here, you look at what's going on here, and then you say to yourself, now which of these here is identical to which objects over here? That is really puzzling. And um, uh, Kripke is trying not to, not to get into that kind of problem. Yeah? He's trying to say, look, the whole way you specify a possible world is by saying, this one's got Nixon in it, and that one's got Nixon in it. And you just, you, you use the name to guarantee the sameness of the object across the worlds. Yep. Um, but that does lead to some pretty murky consequences. Like, uh, you and the, if you don't mind me taking you, you, you and your neighbor as examples, right? In this, uh, uh, it, 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 the, the, there's a possible world in which, okay, you're wearing a hat and your neighbor is not wearing a hat. If, I mean, <laughs> I hope you don't mind me doing this, right? But you're wearing a hat. You're, so there's a world in which um, your neighbor is wearing the hat and you're not wearing the hat, right? Um, so th there's a world in which you swap hats. There's a world in which you swap clothes. There's a world in which you swap many of your temperamental characteristics. I mean, presumably... If you go like this, you know, if, if, if your name is A and, you, and your neighbor's name is B, right? There's a world in which um, B gets all of A's characteristics 
and A gets all of B's characteristics. Yeah? So you, <laughs> I mean, that, that seems to make sense in Kripke's picture. There could be a world in which everybody in the room kind of shuffles around, um, yeah, takes on everybody else's characteristics, and you just stipulate that so. You say, imagine the world in which A has got the hat, and you, you, you see what I mean? Um, and the whole idea of, of your question, well, what makes it the same, is to say, well, I don't know that that really makes sense. If you describe a world in which it's just like this one, the class looks just like this one, but everybody's shuffled round. You think, well, what makes it the case that it's the same? What, 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 what makes it the case that it's the same person here who's sitting in this chair as is sitting in that chair in the other class? You know, it all looks just the same as this class. It looks like everybody's sitting in just the same chair. You, you see what I mean? So that seems kind of mysterious, but it is a consequence of Kripke's picture. Um, uh, yes? <laughs> yes, um, that's right. Uh, that we should avoid this by yes. Right. So it's, uh, the, the, the idea is that some objects do have essential properties and they can't vary them in different worlds. But, uh, I, I, and so then you have to get into the question, well, what characteristics of an object are essential to it? Yeah? And um, the trouble is, there are some characteristics of an object that seem to be essential to it, like um, being a person. Right? If I say, well, um, okay, it's one thing for everybody to be shuffling around one in the class. What about a world in which you're made of wood? You're actually a chair. You, you see what I mean? You might think, oh, well, there you go too far. Um, <laughs> shuffling around is one thing, but actually being a chair or being a frog or being um, a, a wave out at sea, uh, uh, yeah, that, that, that's not really possible. Um, but the trouble is, that's kind of intuitive, but um, the trouble is, are you going to be able to amp that up, that doctrine of essential properties, to such an extent that you can stop people shuffling around? You, you see what I mean? That... It's not that it seems completely hopeless, but it doesn't seem obvious either that you could do that. Yeah. So there is a puzzle for Kripke, how you stop the shuffle. If you can just stipulate is Nixon in another, you're talking about in another possible world, and then go to speculate as to whatever might be going on with him in that world, it seems like it could be just anything. Yeah. Well, or at any rate, the essential properties are not going to put that much of a dampener on um, what you speculate might be happening in that world. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Right. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Ah. Ah. Current is interesting. Um, but it is, um, I, I read current as, if you put in current, the current, well, not the current president of the United States, yeah. Um, uh, I read that as flexible, yeah, because if Al Gore is looking at um, Obama, say, and saying, that could have been me, he doesn't mean he could have been Obama. You, you see what I mean? He, he, he means he could have been the current president of the United States. So he's thinking that's flexible. Yes. <laughs> that's, <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I don't mean that said in store, uh, you know, uh, God told me, but um, um, so far as straight off, my feeling is that only, it's only when you put in an actual that you get this effect. Yeah. Um, there are interesting analogies between time and possible worlds. You can, think of ti uh, talk, you can think of time analogously to possible worlds, and you can think of descriptions, that, uh, uh, designators that vary, have different references at different times, as opposed to designators that designate the same thing relative to all times. Yeah. And when you think about that, current is really kind of analogous to actually, but it's only an analogy, it's not, it's not the same thing.
Okay, is this all right about uh, the inventor of the wheel and the actual inventor of the wheel? Yeah, that's all right? Okay, now I think what happened last time was I, I said, okay, I'm going to introduce a name, Bright, for the inventor of the wheel. And the way I hear that is when you... I mean, Kripke says names aren't, uh, aren't typically descriptive. And uh, that's all right. I, I, I'm not quarreling with that argument. But I just say... I'm going to dub the, I'm going to say whoever it is that invented the wheel, I'm going to call them Bright, and that's a name. And I mean, Kripke can't stop me. Right, I'll, I'll, I'll do what I like. Uh, yeah, I, I can call him Bright if, or her Bright if I want. Yeah. Um, uh, and then the thing is, my ear is that when you say by Bright, I shall mean the actual inventor of the wheel, the inventor of the wheel, you always, when it's a name, kind of stick in an actually. So that really you're using bright as rigid. Yeah. My ear says I can make sense of the supposition that bright may not have invented the wheel. Now the thing is that you guys quite rightly picked up uh, on the possibility that bright uh, could be used as actually strictly synonymous with this description. So then it would not be rigid but flexible. So there are two ways you could go. You could say bright means the actual inventor of the wheel. Or you could say bright means the inventor of the wheel. And if you say bright means the actual inventor of the wheel, that's to say that it's um, rigid, whereas what you guys are saying, or many of you were saying was, if bright means the, just the inventor of the wheel, then that's um, flexible. Yes? Um, and I actually compounded the confusion by um, using the strangler as my um, example, because there it really is. Well. I, th I still think my ear is it's a little bit weird to use that as flexible. I mean, look, let, let me give an example. If you say the president, that really is flexible, right? I mean, Al Gore can say, I could have been the president. Um, you can meet, uh, it, it specifies a role. If you meet an aged Jimmy Carter at a, a dinner in Washington somewhere, he might say to you plaintively, I used to be president, you know. Um, my hearing of the strangler was not that it was um, uh, flexible like that, but I think it's a, it's a possible interpretation that it's flexible. You can, you can imagine someone saying, I used to be the strangler. I don't think much of the new guy. What do you think? Um, you see what I mean? You could use the strangler as a name for a role. Yeah? Uh, and the way you use the president as a name for a role. And I think that, uh, I think that is how you were hearing it. Um, it's a name for a role, and in that case, it is flexible. Someone else could have been the strangler, just as someone else could have been the president. Yes? But I wasn't hearing it like that. I was hearing it as meaning the actual, the, uh, whoever's actually done it, a particular person that we're then going to speculate about. But once you say that, I think that sorts it all out. Is that right? So if Bright's, if, if you interpret Bright as meaning... Um, uh, just the inventor of the wheel, and that's flexible. But if you hear it the way I was hearing it as the actual inventor of the wheel, then that's rigid. So then, if you say, if you hear it the way I was hearing it, and you say Bright is the inventor of the wheel, then that's a priori, but it's not necessary. So there you go. We just blew up the, the idea that a priori truths are all necessary. The nice thing about this example is it seems so clear to everyone, uh, so it's clear what's going on. Yeah. Oh, this is the rigid use. So if you take the rigid use here, then this is rigid, this is flexible. So different possible worlds, this is picking out something different. This is always picking out the same thing. Yeah. So if I say, well, Bright could have been hit by an asteroid, then um, uh, Bright wouldn't have invented the wheel. Yeah, so I'm hearing it as rigid. And then it's not necessary that Bright invented the wheel because it could have been prevented. She could have been prevented. Um, but it is a priori because if anyone invented the wheel, it was Bright. Yep. So the actual statement is the actual inventor of the wheel is the inventor of the wheel? That's right. Uh, that's a priori, right? But not necessary. The actual inventor of the wheel is the inventor of the wheel. Very good. Yeah. Okay? So the thing this brings out is when you get something that is a sign having as reference fixed by a description, then 
it really could be rigid or flexible. That was really the model of the discussion last time. I was saying I hear it when it's a name is always being rigid. You guys are saying no, but it could be flexible. And that's right. And that's where someone mentioned intention, right? You, you get a choice. If you're hooking up the name to the reference by means of a description, you get a choice as to whether it's um, rigid or flexible. That's all right? Okay. Um, but then think about, I mean, the whole point of a lot of Kripke's discussion is this is really an untypical case. Usually, the connect between a name and an object is set up by a causal chain. And if it's a causal chain that's setting up the name object connection, there's no role being specified that something different could be meeting in different possible worlds. If it's just a causal connection setting up the connect between the name and the object, then um, it looks like that has to be rigid. You couldn't keep the meaning of the name constant but vary the object. I mean, what would it mean to keep the causal connection constant but vary the object? It doesn't, I mean, it's a bit like if you imagine having a telephone conversation with someone, um, you can say, well, I might not have had that conversation with that person. So there's you and the other person and this causal connection between you down the telephone line. But it hardly makes sense to say, I could have been having that very same conversation but a different person there. A causal connection, if it's going to be the same causal connection, it's going to be the same things on both ends. So um, if it's a causal connection between the object and the sign, that is making it true that the sign refers to the object, then you couldn't keep constant the meaning of the sign, but vary the object. So uh, that case of descriptive names is very unusual. Um, usually it's a causal connection that's fixing the reference to the sign, and then the designator has always got to be rigid. The name has to be a rigid designator. Yes? N is the number of cows in the field. Yes, that's right. A priori, but necessary. Yeah. So, Yes. Uh, almost, um, when you say, let, uh, I can't remember if it was N or M, so, uh, 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 say it's N is the number of cows in the, cows in the field, right? Um, then N is not there being used as a variable. I, I see why you say it's a variable, but it isn't really being used as a variable. I mean, remember, if you're doing this in a maths class, you know, <laughs> probably not a very hard maths class, but um, uh, if you're not there using it, you're there using it as a sign for a particular number. And the task that you'd be set is, find out what that number is. So its, it's reference really has been fixed by this when you say N is the number of cows in the field. Yeah? So it's standing for a definite number of cows. It's just unknown. It's just unknown, that's right. And you've got to find it out. And so it's not necessary because that unknown number could have been different. That's right. There could have been a different number of cows in the field. Yeah? But it's still a priori that N is the number of cows in the field. And anyone who says, ah, but maybe you're wrong, maybe it's not N, that's, that, <laughs> that's just, a, you're making a joke if you say that, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> really. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. Well, the, 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 this is the subtle thing with um, where the actually comes in. I mean, to, uh, I, I realize I'm doing the same thing again. I'm assuming that when, once you make, once you have a name here, yeah, this is um, the number of cows that are actually in the field. Yeah, you're not assuming that it varies depending on wh how many cows. Are, uh, yeah, oops, um, vary, yeah, you can speculate had n not been the number of cows in the field. Yeah, had there been more cows in the field. That makes perfect sense, it seems to me. Yeah. Um, but as with the strangler, you can read it as a name, as, as uh, you could read it, I think, as uh, uh, implying a role. But I do actually think it's a very, um, 
Um, it's a kind of unnatural reading, if you don't mind my saying so. Uh, as with the strangler, uh, I'll be your strangler tonight. You know, <laughs> you can <laughs> you you can make sense of that way of talking, yeah. But um, uh, it's a little bit weird, yeah. Okay. 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 Well, let's see. Um. One last bit of geeking, geeking out on rigid designation. So what is a rigid designator? As Kripke's official definition is, we'll call something a rigid designator if, in every possible world, it designates the same object. And of course, the same things can have different names in other possible worlds that came up earlier. Um, you can make sense of saying, suppose Al Gore had not been called Al Gore. Yes, we've got the actual world in which Al is called Al, and then we've got this other world in which um, his, his parents decided to call him something different. Yep, that makes perfect sense. You could have had a different name. People sometimes complain about their names. If only... Well, actually, <laughs> I'm going to give some examples, but there may be some people of this name in the class. So I, I, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> you can think of your own, right? OK? That makes perfect sense. Um, in every possible world, it designates the same object. That's what a rigid designator is. Um, but of course, there are going to be some possible worlds in which the object doesn't exist. I mean, people sometimes say God exists necessarily, or numbers exist necessarily. But you and I, presumably, don't exist necessarily. And if your parents had never met, you would not have existed. Yeah? Um, so, suppose you, you consider the possibility in which Al Gore doesn't exist. Relative to that possibility, does the name designate anything? Well, you could say um, it's a rigid designator if in every possible world in which the object exists, um, we're only going to consider the worlds in, in which the object exists, and relative to those worlds, the name always designates the same thing. Yeah. Or you, but, but what about the worlds where the wo object doesn't exist? Does the um, name designate anything relative to such a world? Well, you could say, with Hesperus and Phosphorus, you could say, in any possible world in which Hesperus exists, it refers to uh, the same thing. In any possible world in which phosphorus exists, it's always referring to the same, the name's always referring to the same thing. Um, so in any possible world in which these, uh, relative to which these two terms are designating something, um, the statement's necessary. I mean, it doesn't really get an evaluation with respect to a world in which Hesperus doesn't exist. I mean, if the, if the uh, planets had been formed in a different way, then Hesperus might never have come into existence. Right? That makes sense. So relative to that world, is it true that Hesperus is phosphorus? In that world, is Hesperus phosphorus? Hard to say. No? <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bit strange. Yes, it's, it's, it's hard to know quite what to say about that case. Yeah. So you could say it's weakly necessary in the sense that it's not that it's true in every possible world, it's just that it's true in every world in which that planet exists. Yeah? It's true in every world in which Venus exists. So that would be a little bit weaker than saying it's true in absolutely every world in which, um, in, every world, uh, in any world at all. Um, or you could have a stronger definition of rigid designator. This is just like a homework question. I mean, it's, uh, um, it's, not, it's not really clear, it seems to me, which way to go on this. You could say I'm going to have a stronger definition. In every possible world, the name designates the same object, whether or not the object exists in that world. <laughs> yeah, isn't that weird? Um, but suppose you consider an example like, if Hitler had never been born, the world would have been a better place. Okay. Well, if you want to consider um, that possibility, Okay, I'm using the name here to specify the possible world. Yeah? So I use the name, 
and I specify this world. This is the world in which it's true that Hitler was never born. Yeah? But if it's true in that world that Hitler was never born, then the name Hitler must be designating something relative to that world. So, is it, is desi well, you can't, well, no, it's not designating an absence, it's designating a person. He just happens not to be there in that world. Just think how, you're going to, how you make sense of this. If Hitler had never been born, I'm referring to a particular person, Hitler, and I'm specifying this possibility. He was never born. So how should you say you, you load the name up into the proposition you're considering? Sorry, you load the object up. You load Hitler up into the proposition you're considering. And then you take it around the possible worlds and you look at what's happening in each possible world. And in some of those, Hitler is there. And in some of those, he isn't. You see what I mean? But you seem to need to think about it in that way. Because if you say, if Hitler had never been born, well, I wouldn't have known who you were talking about. That doesn't seem the right answer. Yeah, it seems perfectly clear that this is true. Well, I mean, yeah, it seems <laughs> there's nothing controversial about that. It seems perfectly clear that that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Very good, yes. Yes. It's very hard to know what to say about the unicorns in this kind of picture, because how does the term have meaning? Um, in the actual world, there are no unicorns, yeah? So there's nothing to be causing the use of the term unicorn. So... It must be descriptive, yeah, and whatever has a horn, something that has a horn. Is, is that right? I, I, I'm not sure if that's right. Um, it's hard to know how it's got meaning, the term unicorn. I mean, how, how does it have, how, do, how come I know what you're talking about when you say unicorn? Because there's nothing, there's nothing that I'm causally connected to, yeah? You're referencing the concept, yeah. Um, but that's not what you mean. The concept doesn't have a horn, right? Uh, you mean the unicorn's got a horn, not the concept of unicorn's got a horn, <laughs> right? Like when you're talking about a unicorn, you're referencing the concept of a unicorn, you're talking about the unicorn, you're talking about the unicorn. Right. Well, yeah, I, it's very hard to know how to evaluate the kind of claim. Um, it's necessary that unicorns have horns. I mean, I mean, after all, if, there's a, if, you, if you take uh, cows, I mean, co cows, I mean, uh, bulls, <laughs> take, well, uh, something that I, I'm not very sure what I said. Moose, no, they have antlers. Um, <laughs> rams, rams of horns, right? Um, anyway, um, um, so rams of horns, that's true in this world, right? Uh, is it necessarily true? Well, I guess not. I mean, after all, um, rams could have had horns bred out of them. It could have happened thousands of years ago. There could have been some genetic mutation a couple of thousand years ago, or tens of thousands of years ago, as a result of which the rams never got horns. You can make sense of that. How does it go with unicorns? I mean, I don't know. I mean, how do you find out about the genetics of the unicorn? Um, you, you, you see what I mean? It, it, it's very hard to know how to evaluate these statements about unicorns. Um, yeah. And there's something... So, the causal theory says it's hard to know how to interpret a statement about unicorns. The causal theory has difficulty interpreting statements about unicorns, but I actually suspect that you and I do too. If you see what I mean, if you really pushed us on what we're talking about when we're talking about unicorns and what's true about unicorns and what's necessary, it's not that clear anyway, I think, yeah. yeah. Yep. That's the one, yes, that's yes. right. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, I'm sure uh, there are other people in Germany that unfortunately have that name. So you could be referring to somebody else. So it doesn't really seem like just a word has meaning. I, I hold it. And, you know, it doesn't, don't 
you have to, isn't meaning really just a property of um, statements or of a language as a whole? Uh, well, if you're going to talk about truth or falsity of individual statements, it's hard to see how a meaning can be just a characteristic of the language as a whole, because then you couldn't talk about the truth or falsity of an individual statement. Yeah. Um, so, so long as we are able to talk about a particular particular statements being true or false, then uh, it does seem like we must be able to explain how the components of the statement are contributing to that truth or falsity. Yeah, that's that notion of semantic value, and the only, the, really, the only way of explaining what a name is bringing to a statement being true or false is its reference. You could throw that out and say. I don't believe there's any such notion of truth. Yeah? We only evaluate um, the totality of statements made in a culture or something. That totality is right or wrong. Uh, but it's a really wild view that, yeah, I mean, I mean people have held just about any possible view here. Yeah. But um, it really is not commonsensical. You don't know what it makes sense to make of inference in such a case, yeah? Because inference is taking you from true statements to true statements, if it's correct, yeah. Okay. Okay, so you could say Hesperus is phosphorus is strongly necessary in that it's true in any world whether or not um, Venus exists in that world. Right? Even in worlds in which Hesperus and the phosphorus don't exist, it's still true that Hesperus is phosphorus. So these are two different definitions of rigidity. In every possible world in which the object exists, the term designates that same object, and in every possible world in which, um, in every possible world, whatever, the term is still designating the same object, whether or not the object exists in that world. That's the point of the Hitler example. Okay, I think we'll leave it there for geeking out on um, rigidity and necessity. Okay, we, we will um, move on to Putnam uh, on Friday. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the discussion. <laughs>